interviews are India's voice to the world. I'm Preeti Kaur, coming up in the next one hour. U.S. President says U.S.-Japan alliance is stronger than ever as he hosts Japanese Prime Minister Kishida at a state dinner. Two leaders hold bilateral meeting and agree on over 70 agreements, strengthening the defense ties. Kishida to address U.S. Congress on Thursday. Security in Indo-Pacific encountering Chinese pressure on the Philippines in the dispute at South China Sea in focus as Biden to host leaders of Japan and Philippines in a trilateral summit. Three sons of Hamas leader Ismail Haniye killed in Israeli airstrike. Israel says Haniye's sons were operators in the Hamas armed wing. U.S. President urges Hamas to accept later ceasefire deal. In Champions League, Spanish club Barcelona beat Paris Saint-Germain in the third in a thrilling quarter-final force leg clash. In other match, Atletico Madrid survived late Dortmund pressure to hold on for 2-1 win. And India celebrates Eid al-Fitr today, marking the end of the fasting month of Ramadan. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi extends wishes on the occasion. U.S. President Joe Biden and First Lady hosted Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida and his wife for a state dinner at the White House. During a toast at the state dinner, Biden stated that the alliance between the two countries is stronger than ever. Kishida further emphasized on Biden's sentiment, asserting that despite the Pacific Ocean between the two nations, the pioneer spirit, spirit of those who come before us had them united. Japan and the United States. Many, we may be divided by distance, but the generations after generation, we've been brought together the same hopes, the same values, the same commitment to democracy and freedom and to dig dignity for all. And today, without question, our alliance is literally stronger than it has ever been. Japan and the United States are united than ever before. I believe that the Pacific Ocean has brought Japan and the United States together and so close because of the pioneering spirit of those who came before us and frontier spirit that we all have in common. Kishida will also address the U.S. Congress on Thursday before joining Biden and Philippines President for the Trilateral Summit. Meanwhile, President Biden is hosting the leaders of the Philippines and Japan on Thursday, a day after he held a bilateral summit with a visiting Japanese dignitary. The three countries are expected to talk about economic ties and to lock in defense deals they see as crucial in securing the Indo-Pacific. Caroline Malone reports from Washington on this. It was clear from Wednesday's White House events between U.S. President Biden and Japanese Prime Minister Kishida that the two are similarly aligned in wanting to forge a positive alliance in the Indo-Pacific to secure a prosperous and safe region. To do that, they've announced key defense deals with the promise of more to come. Under his leadership, Japan set in motion profound changes in its defense policies and its capabilities. Now. Now our two countries are building a stronger defense partnership and a stronger Indo-Pacific Indo than ever before. As a global partner, Japan will join hands with our American friends and together we will lead the way in tackling the challenges of the Indo-Pacific and the world. Looking ahead toward the world will be like 10 years, 100 years and now while tirelessly developing the relationships between our countries. And ahead of Thursday's trilateral between the US and Japan and the Philippines, President Marcos said he sees the focus of meetings being on strengthening economic relations, but also on security. 
that he said the main intent of this trilateral is for us to be able to continue to flourish, to be able to help one another, and of course to keep the peace in the South China Sea and the freedom of navigation. The US, Japan and the Philippines, along with Australia, held military drills in the South China Sea over the weekend. Before those exercises, the four countries said they intend to uphold the right to freedom of navigation and respect maritime rights under international law. The implication of all of this is that they want to ward off increasingly assertive actions from China in the South China Sea. Well, President Biden said, alongside Japanese Prime Minister Kishida on Wednesday, that he will be welcoming another friend to the White House on Thursday, a sign of the warmer ties that are strengthening between all three countries. Caroline Malone in Washington for Didi India. On Wednesday, Prime Minister Kishida presented new cherry trees in Washington, D.C.'s Tidal Basin. The new trees will replace the older ones that will be removed for repairs at the site. In total, Japan will donate 250 new cherry trees to mark U.S.'s 250th birthday in 2026. Japan has given the U.S. some 3,000 cherry trees as part of a symbolic gesture of friendship between the two nations. All right, shifting focus to Israel-Hamas conflict now. Three sons of Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh were killed in an Israeli airstrike in Gaza on Wednesday. The Israeli military confirmed carrying out the attack and described the three sons as operators in the Hamas. Haniyeh is based abroad in Qatar and the face of Hamas's international diplomacy. His family home was destroyed in an Israeli airstrike back in November. Meanwhile, Hamas said it was studying an Israeli ceasefire proposal and termed it as intransigent, saying it met none of the Palestinian demands. Meanwhile, U.S. President Joe Biden has urged Hamas on Wednesday to accept the latest proposal for a temporary ceasefire in Gaza in exchange for the release of hostages. We're not going to stop until we do. The new proposal on the table, when Bill Burns led the effort to, uh, for us, we're grateful for his work. There's a now up to Hamas. They need to move on the proposal that's been made. And as I said, uh, we'll get these hostages home where they belong, but also bring back a six-week ceasefire that we need now. And the fact is that we're, uh, we're getting in somewhere in the last three days over 100 trucks. It's not enough, but we need to get more. And there's one more opening that has to take place in the north. So we'll see what he does in terms of meeting the commitments he made to me. Let's get you an update on the humanitarian aid. Now, Israel will soon open a new land crossing into the Gaza Strip, designed mainly to facilitate aid deliveries from overseas or neighboring Jordan to Palestinians. Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant said a new crossing point would be created on the northern part of the Gaza border to reduce the time taken to truck in aid from Ashdod. Israel has gradually reopened two established cargo crossings and created a new crossing on its border. Last week, it also announced to admit Gaza-bound aid shipments at its southern port of Ashdod. Israel has also helped set up a maritime corridor for direct deliveries of aid to Gaza by sea and opened its airspace to foreign planes that have parachuted in aid for the Palestinians. Germany's Lufthansa Airlines suspended flights to Tehran because of the situation in the Middle East as the region is on alert for possible Iranian retaliation over a suspected Israeli airstrike on Iran's embassy in Syria. An Iranian news agency briefly stoked tensions further when it published an Arabic report on social media platform X saying all airspace over Tehran had been closed for military drills. The agency then removed the report and denied it had issued any such news. Lufthansa Airlines said it suspended flights to and from Tehran from April 6 till 11th. There was no immediate word from other international airlines that fly to Tehran. Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah al Khamenei, said that Israel must be punished for the Damascus strike that killed seven Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps members. In an apparent response to Khamenei, Israeli Foreign Minister Israel Katz said on Wednesday that Israel will respond if Iran attacks Israel from its own soil. <clears throat> U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has made it clear that the United States would stand with Israel against any threats by Iran. 
Blinken, in a call with Israeli Defense Minister Yav Gallen, discussed ongoing efforts to secure the release of all hostages through an agreement for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Donald Trump's criminal hush money case is set to go to trial on April 15th as a New York appeals judge on Wednesday denied Trump's third last-ditch attempt to delay his hush money trial, paving the way for the first ever trial of a former U.S. president. During an earlier hearing, Trump lawyer Emil Bove said that the trial should be delayed because Justice Hua Mershon, who is overseeing the case, has not yet ruled on their request for him to recuse himself. The case is one of the four criminal indictments Trump faces as he prepares to challenge Democratic President Joe Biden in their November 5th U.S. election rematch. He has sought to delay proceedings in all cases until after the election. And the hush money case is the only one with a firm trial date. The decision from the Arizona Supreme Court on Tuesday pushed the abortion issue at center of 2024 presidential election that could, in fact, play a pivotal role in November's U.S. presidential election. Democrats wasted little time capitalizing on Tuesday's ruling from Arizona's high court, upholding a 160-year-old abortion ban, organizing press conferences in swing states across the country, and blaming former Republican President Donald Trump for el eliminating a nationwide right to abortion. In addition, abortion rights advocates are working to put a ballot measure before voters in November that would enshrine abortion rights protections into the Arizona state constitution. Trump, seeking to distance himself from the ruling, said on Wednesday that the court had gone too far, even while defending the U.S. Supreme Court's decision that permitted states to restrict abortion. He called on the state's Republican-controlled legislature and Democratic governor to amend the law. It's been five years since WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange was forcibly expelled from the Ecuadorian embassy in London into the hands of the waiting British police officers. Since then, he has been fighting extradition to the United States from an English prison on multiple charges of espionage. But his time in the UK could be close to an end, as Stuart Smith reports from London. After a series of appeal hearings, next week is the deadline for the US Justice Department to assure the High Court in London that Julian Assange will be treated fairly if deported to the US. If it doesn't provide those assurances, he'll be granted an appeal in Britain in May. Assange has been wanted by American authorities since 2019 for allegedly repeatedly violating the US Espionage Act, and he's been held at a British maximum security prison since then. His website, WikiLeaks, hosted tens of thousands of classified documents related to America's military and diplomatic activities worldwide. His supporters say the charges are politically motivated and his conviction would represent an assault on freedom of speech and freedom of the press. The International Federation of Journalists, as well as press giants in the US, UK, France, Germany and Spain, have called for his release. But the US Justice Department says the publishing of some of those documents endangered the lives of informants. They claim he should not be treated as an ordinary journalist and that WikiLeaks was not an ordinary publisher. At court earlier in the year, they claimed Assange sought to solicit, steal and indiscriminately publish US government documents and he should be punished. England's High Court judges found the 52-year-old Australian can be extradited to the US to face justice there, but only if the US government can prove he will be treated fairly. It has until next week to provide those assurances, or he will be entitled to appeal this extradition. The US government must convince the court that he is afforded the same First Amendment protections as a United States citizen, which protects freedom of speech, and that the death penalty will not be imposed. Stuart Smith in London, reporting for DD India. You're watching DD India News Hour. We're heading for a short break, but after the break, South Korea President Yoon Suk Yeol suffers a major blow as Liberal opposition parties score a landslide victory in the parliamentary election. Flood swamps swathes of Russia and Kazakhstan, but worse still to come. 
and we show you the captivating visuals of the eclipse captured by the skydivers while taking the plunge. Opposition stuns Erdogan with historic victory in Turkish local poll. Will the defeat force Erdogan to reset his foreign policy? Will artificial intelligence enslave humans? And crypto king Sam Bankman Fried will grow old in jail. So, what lessons should we learn from his conviction? Watch Connecting the Dots to get the full picture every Friday at 8 pm IST on DD India. Welcome back after the break. You're watching DD India News Hour and I'm Preeti. Let's continue getting you more international updates. South Korean President Yoon Suk Yeol's ruling party suffered a resounding blow in legislative elections held on Wednesday. The country's Liberal Opposition Party scored a landslide victory but fell just short of a supermajority. The main opposition party, Democratic Party, and its satellite party won a combined 175 seats in the 300-seat parliament. Following the drubbing, Yoon, Prime Minister Han duk -soo and other senior aides tendered their resignation. The election setback is likely to further tie his hands domestically. The National Election Commission is expected to confirm the final results later on Thursday. And DD India correspondent Chris Gilbert gets us more. This is a significant setback uh, for the PPP, for Yoon suk Yeol's party. He is now set to become the first ever South Korean president to do a five-year term with no party control uh, over the National Assembly at all. And so that effectively, as experts are saying, makes him a lame duck for the rest of the uh, three years of his term. Uh, he was, of course, elected uh, into a situation which had an opposition Democratic Party controlled parliament. And now it is the status quo. It looks to have become, uh, you know, a, a stronger hold on the uh, parliament for uh, the Democratic Democratic Party. President Yoon suk yeol has already come out and said that he accepts the results of the election and he is looking ahead. He's saying that he wants to now focus on stabilizing the lives uh, of the people of South Korea and stabilizing the economy. Uh, obviously, this is a terrible situation politically uh, for the PPP. They may, there may have to be some soul searching and, and some regrouping that they uh, are going to have to do. Uh, there also is going to be some analysis of how the uh, constituents and the demographics in South Korea are changing, um, especially considering that you know what has traditionally been a very bipartisan country is now becoming less so. With experts saying about 30% um, of the electorate uh, is was undecided, uh, or perhaps a, a newly emerged swing voter going into this uh, election, which you know with the analysis in the days and weeks to come may show uh, you know, that is the reason behind some of the strength of the DP's win. Um, but you know for Yoon suk yeol the, the pressure is going to be on maintaining uh, his message for South Korea on the global stage, especially well, with the relations with Japan, especially relations with the United States, when he doesn't have any control over the parliament. For the parliament, it means they're going to have to focus on their agenda, but they don't have the power to veto Yoon suk yeols veto. So there are some challenges ahead. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un on Thursday said unstable geopolitical situations surrounding his country mean now is the time to be more prepared for war than ever as he inspected the country's main military university. Kim gave field guidance on Wednesday at Kim jong Two University of Military and Politics and met with university staff and students. North Korea has stepped up weapon development in recent years under Kim and has forged closer military and political ties with Russia, allegedly aiding Moscow in its war with Ukraine in return for help with strategic military projects. Update on Russia-Ukraine conflict now. Russian airstrikes on Ukraine's northeastern Kharkiv region hit a clinic and a pharmacy on Wednesday. The regional governor, Ole Sineyubov, said that the strike killed at least three people, a 14-year-old girl and two women, and two people were injured. The rescuers continued searching through the rubble for the victims. Russia, however, denies deliberately targeting the civilians. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky expressed his condolences to those killed in the Russian airstrikes. 
Today, Russian terrorists again hit our communities with guided bombs, notably in the Kharkiv region. There are casualties with three confirmed deaths, including one child. My condolences to all who have lost loved ones. This Russian terror day and night at our border and in frontline areas. Several dozen Russian recruits held live fire exercises on an undisclosed training ground in the Kyiv region after enlisting in Ukraine's Siberian battalion on Wednesday. Their war-hardened instructors said they returned from the group's cross-border march raids into Russia's Belgorod and Kursk regions to train the new joinees. Russian officials cast the group as a puppet of Ukraine's military and the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency. Finland President Alexander Stubb met NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg at NATO's headquarters in Brussels on Wednesday. Both the leaders discussed military aid for Ukraine, particularly the urgent need for air defence. Stoltenberg acknowledged the efforts of NATO allies in providing long-range systems and missiles to Ukraine. He said that delays in delivery of air defences will allow Russian missiles to hit more targets. Stoltenberg stressed on the importance of reliable and predictable aid for Ukraine. Today, in our meeting, we discussed uh, Ukraine and the urgent need uh, for uh, more uh, support and reliable and predictable support for Ukraine. Delays in delivery of air defenses will allow Russian missiles to hit uh, more uh, targets, and delays in delivery of ammunition will allow Russia to press along the front line. Ukraine uh, simply cannot wait. Uh, it needs air defenses, ammunition and aid now. Germany has stated that it is very sensible to invest private capital in Ukraine now to ensure its presence after the end of the war. After a cabinet meeting, German Economic Cooperation and Development Minister Svenja Scholz said that Chancellor Olaf Scholz's cabinet put together key points to attract private money to Ukraine. He added that public money will not be enough and encouraged German businesses to help Ukraine get back on its feet after the war. Currently, there are around 2,000 German companies active in Ukraine. There are roughly 2,000 companies which are currently active in Ukraine. Public money won't be enough. We also need private investors, which is why we put together 15 key points today, how we want to support those efforts. One very important such point is obviously the support of German companies. The Swiss government said that it will host a two-day high-level conference in June aimed at achieving peace in Ukraine. The conference will be held on June 15th and 16th at the Bergenstock Resort in the canton of Nidwalden, outside the city of Luzerne. It will aim to create a framework favorable to a comprehensive and lasting peace in Ukraine, as well as a concrete roadmap for Russia's participation in the peace process. Although Russia has made it clear that it will not take part in the initiative. Floods continue to engulf cities and towns across Russia and Kazakhstan after Europe's third longest river burst its banks. The water level continues to rise in flood zones while large amount of water is coming to new regions. Kremlin says the forecast is unfavorable. Over 110,000 people have been evacuated so far from the affected regions. Upstream on the Ural, which flows into Kazakhstan, flood waters burst when embankment dam in the city of Orsk on Friday. Unusual floods that have gripped cities and towns in both the countries can be explained by the heavy accumulation of snow during the winter and the speed at which it melts due to climate change. In the U.S., severe storms are battering parts of the south with torrential rain and life-threatening flooding. Drone footage showed flooding in Belton, Texas, as storms swept across the state. The National Weather Service issued severe thunderstorm watch, warning the people in Texas of large hail and strong damaging winds. Local police closed multiple roads due to floods. Canada risks another catastrophic wildfire season 
as it forecasted higher than normal spring and summer temperatures across much of the country. Last year, Canada endured its worst ever fire season with more than 6,600 blazes burning 15 million hectares, an area roughly seven times the annual average. Eight firefighters died and 230,000 people were evacuated from their homes. This winter, the country experienced warmer than normal temperatures and widespread drought, setting the stage for another punishing summer ahead. The European Parliament voted on Wednesday to pass a law to reduce carbon dioxide emissions from the trucks. The move will require most new heavy-duty vehicles sold in the EU from 2040 to be emissions-free. The law will enforce a 90% cut in CO2 emissions from new heavy-duty vehicles by 2040. To attempt to pull the transport sector in line with climate change targets, truck manufacturers will also have to reduce the carbon dioxide emissions of their fleets by 45% by 2030 and 65% by 2035. The policy still needs final approval from EU countries, a step that is usually a formality and approves a law with no changes. Meanwhile, campaigners are demanding higher taxes on the ultra-wealthy, saying it could raise up to $286 billion for the European Union's most vulnerable. The protesters say they will land a private jet in front of the European Parliament in protest on Thursday. However, that claim could just be a marketing gimmick for the bigger cause. Ishan Garg has more from Brussels. Campaigners will gather outside the European Parliament building in Brussels demanding a 2 to 5% progressive tax on the ultra-rich. They say it could pay for up to 40% of the EU's post-pandemic recovery fund. Global NGO Oxfam says the EU's five richest billionaires have boosted their wealth by 76% since 2020. They claim 99% of the European population has become relatively poorer in the same time period. A study commissioned by the EU's executive arm has found that a progressive wealth tax on the bloc's richest 0.5% could generate more than $200 billion every year. NGOs including Oxfam, Avaaz and We Move Europe are organizing Thursday's protest. They claim they will land a jet in Luxembourg Square in the heart of the Belgian capital in the middle of the narrow cobbled streets leading up to the European Parliament building. Now, this stunt, which is unlikely to happen in practice, is supposed to be a commentary on how the ultra-wealthy are hurting the environment by flying in private planes. The campaigners are hoping to raise awareness about climate change and will lobby European lawmakers to bring in laws to tax big individuals individual polluters. Organizers say the ultra-wealthy and their companies paying far too little tax is at the core of many of Europe's problems. During this protest, they will demand more measures to address billionaires allegedly using shell companies to evade taxes. They say urgent action by authorities is required to reduce the wealth gap between the bloc's richest and poorest. Ishan Garg in Brussels, reporting for DD India. Eid al-Fitr is also being celebrated with joy and reverence on Thursday in Bangladesh. Traditional congregation was held at the National Eid Ka Maidan and other places in Dhaka. Thousands of people, including eminent personalities, political personalities and also others, took part in the Eid congregation held in Dhaka and other parts of the country. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi has extended warm greetings to the people of Bangladesh on the occasion of Eid. In a letter to Bangladesh Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, Prime Minister Modi hoped and prayed for peace, harmony, good health and happiness for people across the world and wished for the bonds of friendship and camaraderie among our countries to grow stronger. A quick look at other stories making it to the headlines from across the world now. Professional bakers make Turkish drink Turkish dish baklava for Eid, the celebration of Feast of Sweets. Baklava is a layered dessert made of phyllo pastry sheets filled with chopped nuts and sweetened with syrup or honey. These sweets are specially prepared to increase the enthusiasm and joy of the holiday. Italian rescue teams continue to search for survivors after at least three people were killed in an explosion underground at a hydroelectric power plant in northern Italy. Italian utility group confirmed that fire had broken out on one of its transformers at its hydropower plant in Barghi, close to Bellogna in the early afternoon. The cause of the explosion is still not clear. 
The Rio de Janeiro government has deployed a multi-varied set of measures to halt the spread of dengue as Brazil is fighting a record outbreak that has killed over 1,100 people in 2024. The Secretary of Health has rolled out a strategy to release into the air lab-bred mosquitoes with a Wolbachia bacteria to reduce the transmission of mosquito-borne viral diseases such as dengue. Skydivers experienced total solar eclipse on Monday during their fall from an airplane in Texas. Video captured the moment the two couples jumped out of the airplane and then floated in the air as the solar eclipse darkened the sky. The eclipse made landfall to the banks of the Ohio River and farther north. Spellbound crowd reacted to the sight of totality with jaw-dropping expressions of awe and joy. A short break ahead, but on DD Indian News are after the break, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi to hold election rallies in Uttarakhand's Rishikesh and Rajasthan's Dholpur. Large number of devotees gather to offer prayers to Goddess Durga as India celebrates third day of Navratri. Guwahati brimming with festive fervor as the state gears up to celebrate Bohag Bihu, the most significant festival of Assam. state of Tamil Nadu. Voting is our responsibility. This is a big fight between uh, BJP and uh, India Alliance. Will you vote? Ah, what one? Yeah, power of democracy. This is a huge. BJP is trying her best, you know, for the past 10 years under the flagship of uh, Sri Narendra Modi Garu. The 2024 Lok Sabha polls in Tamil Nadu are witnessing the battle royale between DMK, AIA DMK and the BJP. Welcome back after the break. You're watching DD India News R. A quick relook at the top stories once again. US President says US Japan alliance is stronger than ever as he hosts Japanese Prime Minister Kishida at a state dinner. Two leaders hold bilateral meeting and agree on over 70 agreements, strengthening defense ties. Kishida to address US Congress on Thursday. Security in Indo Pacific encountering Chinese pressure on the Philippines in the disputed South China Sea in focus as Biden to host leaders of Japan and Philippines in a trilateral summit. Three sons of Hamas leader Ismail Haniye killed in Israeli airstrike. Israel says Haniye's sons were operatives in Hamas armed wing. US President urges Hamas to accept latest ceasefire deal. In Champions League, Spanish club Barcelona beat Paris Saint-Germain in the thrilling quarter-final first leg clash. In other match, Atletico Madrid survived late Dortmund pressure to hold on for a 2-1 win. India celebrates Eid al-Fitr today, marking the end of the fasting month of Ramadan. Prime Minister Narendra Modi extends wishes on the occasion. And now we get to the latest on the world's largest democratic election in India. Election season is, is at its peak in India with parties organizing multiple public meetings as the first phase of voting is slated for 19th of this month. In order to garner support for the ruling BJP, Prime Minister Narendra Modi will hold election rallies in Uttarakhand's Rishikesh and Rajasthan's Tholpur. With Lok Sabha elections nearing, political parties are ramping up their efforts to woo the voters with leaders actively engaging with the public to garner support. Senior BJP leader and Union Home Minister Amit Shah will hold rallies in Madhya Pradesh's Jabalpur and Khajuraho. Union Minister of Defence Rajnath Singh will visit Madhya Pradesh and will hold a public meeting in Rewa and Satna. To garner support in the favour of the parties, BJP National President J.P. Nadda will also address an election rally in Port Blair, Andaman and Nicobar. 
Also aiming to woo the voters, all political parties are organizing rallies across the country. Congress leader Rahul Gandhi will visit Rajasthan today. He will be holding rallies in Bikaner and Jodhpur to garner support for the party candidates. Bikaner will go to polls in the first phase, that is on April 19th, while Jodhpur polling will be held on April 26th. All right, Akshay Dongre joins us with more from Delhi. Akshay, good morning. Now, we've just given a broad outline of how political parties are leaving no stone unturned to woo the voters. But you're here in the national capital. Uh, let us get a sense of you, uh, from you as to how do you evaluate or for that matter, how do you gauge the political contest this time around? What are the key factors that one should look forward to uh, in this biggest uh, electoral process that is to be witnessed across the world? Well, uh, uh, to talk about the Indian elections, Apriti, we have to understand that uh, this this is in fact a unique uh, sort of an electoral process as far as the Indian elections are concerned, especially when we talk about the general elections. It's not in fact a plain ride, it? it is like a roller coaster when we can see a lot of political parties making promises, leaders shifting from one party to another, uh, people uh, filing their nominations and taking them back, uh, pe uh, you know, a lot of leaders as far as uh, the political parties are concerned, especially in the ruling Bharatiya Janata Party, many of the leaders have been replaced. In fact, when we talk about just Delhi, uh, several uh, uh, of the seven uh, member of parliament, so six of the seven um, uh, parliaments member of parliaments have already been replaced as far as uh, the candidature is concerned. So a lot has uh, has been churning as far as uh, the in, uh, India's uh, political uh, specter is concerned. Now, uh, if we look at uh, the key issues and the key factors that cannot be overlooked as far as the upcoming elections are concerned, then uh, there are uh, certain uh, issues uh, that both the uh, uh, the opposition and the ruling uh, party will be focusing on. Uh, that they include uh, employment uh, for for the people for the for the youth especially. Uh, the the factor about education education higher education that is that is on the top of the agenda healthcare is on the top of the agenda and uh, a, a lot more uh, is being uh, discussed uh, is, is being uh, discussed by the political parties as far as their voter bases are concerned including uh, the security internal and both external security of the country uh, the economic growth uh, that is being talked about and in fact as far as uh, the uh, the last uh, last few months are concerned we have seen that uh, both the both, both the opposition and the ruling parties have been uh, have been uh, locking horns over, over over these these very relevant issues now what the opposition is promising is is higher number of employment what uh, the the ruling uh, bjp is offering at this point of time is more stable government is more uh, is a more stable uh, uh, form of uh, party uh, that that can in fact rule the country for the next five years. However, what we are seeing is that both uh, the BJP and the Congress, main opposition party in the country, are trying to cobble up alliances. Even right now, just ahead of uh, the elections, barely we're barely uh, seven days ahead of the elections, and they are still uh, trying to cobble up more and more alliances with the regional parties uh, to woo voters. Now, promises have been made uh, by the Congress as far as the manifesto is concerned. The Bharatiya Janata Party has taken suggestions from people and they're likely to come up with their own manifesto and uh, as soon as the manifesto comes out we can actually see that what is going to be the roadmap of uh, the largest political party not just here in India but BJP has in fact become the largest political party in the world uh, so what are the BJP's vision uh, for uh, the election are concerned a lot uh, will depend on that as well and a lot of politics can then follow as far as uh, the, the these uh, uh, regional uh, as well as the opposition parties along with uh, the ruling parties are concerned uh, where we can see uh, the blame game taking place uh, where we can see attacks taking place as far as political parties are concerned. So it is in fact going to be a very exciting uh, general elections uh, given the fact that BJP right. has been uh, overwhelmingly strong as far as the election contests in the past are concerned. Alright, so that was about uh, the manifestos, that was about the uh, issues that will be dominating uh, the electoral process uh, this time around. But uh, Akshay, I want another analysis from you as to what would be the key states that one should look forward to uh, this time around, what you know, which states could prove to be game changers, or from where can we expect surprises to spring up? Uh, well, uh, what what we are looking at uh, the political spectrum, there there are two kind of uh, states uh, as far as the categories are concerned. One, there are large states, uh, states like Uttar Pradesh, states like yes. Bihar. Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, Rajasthan, Karnataka. Now these are the massive states and uh, the way Indian elections are held. It is uh, uh, different states are divided different, given rather different seats. For example, the state of Uttar Pradesh uh, has given has been given about 80 seats as far as uh, the Lok Sabha general elections are concerned.
concerned uh, for the parliamentary seats. Uh, when we talk about the national capital, uh, uh, Delhi, it has been given seven seats uh, and uh, so on. Uh, so these kind of states that have a larger number of seats, they, they prove to be in fact uh, game changers as far as the general elections are concerned. In fact, there has been a saying for, for several decades, in fact, uh, uh, you know, uh, soon after the uh, elections had started in India, one thing had become quite clear that uh, the road uh, to uh, New Delhi or the road to becoming Prime Minister goes uh, through the state of Uttar Pradesh, uh, given the fact that it has 80 seats, it can prove to be a game changer. Whosoever controls uh, Uttar Pradesh or uh, controls the narrative there, controls uh, the voters there, uh, they can in fact uh, uh, get an early on lead as far as the seats are concerned. Because uh, if you look at uh, the majority, the simple majority of about uh, 272 seats that are required, uh, then 80 seats are actually a massive number of those uh, seats and uh, uh, the BJP has done remarkably well uh, in, in the last elections and in the election in 2014 as well as far as uh, the state of Uttar Pradesh is concerned. However, when we uh, talk about uh, the states that can in fact bring in surprise, they include the state of West Bengal, which is uh, when we talk about the legislative assembly, it is ruled by uh, a regional party, Trinamool Congress, but when it comes uh, to uh, the national elections last uh, last time in 2019, we saw a lot of surprise. BJP uh, uh, getting a lot of uh, victories in, in the state of West Bengal. Similar is the state uh, with the southern part of India where the Bharti Janata Party has been trying to make a push uh, to, to garner more votes, to garner more seats. Uh, so that can come up as a surprise as well, Preeti. All right. So we'll have to see how the days ahead pan out. Thank you so much, Akshay, for joining in with those details. And all political parties are holding public rallies and roadshows across the country. In West Bengal, the Rai Ganj Lok Sabha constituency that goes to polls in the second phase that is on April 26th is all set to witness star campaigners of both the BJP and the TMC. Prime Minister Modi will address an election campaign at Gualpara in Rai Ganj on April 16th, while West Bengal Chief Minister Mamata Banerjee will be present at Islampur and Karandigi on April 18th for campaigning. Earlier, TMC Supremo Mamata Banerjee took part in a roadshow in Rai Ganj town and also addressed a public meeting in Hemtabad. One of India's battleground states, Bihar, was the talk of the town in recent times due to its challenge changing political alliances. It accounts for 40 lower house seats, the fourth highest in India. Up next is a report which tells you about the state's political and historical significance. The eastern state of Bihar has made immense contribution to the country's history. The first pan-Indian kingdom, the Mauryan Empire, was established here, with its seat at Pataliputra, a region adjacent to the state capital, Patna. The national emblem of India was adapted from the capital of the Mauryan Emperor, Ashoka. Two ancient centers of learning, Nalanda and Vikramshila are also located in the state. During the freedom movement, Mahatma Gandhi launched his first civil resistance movement called Satyagraha in support of indigo farmers in Bihar's Champaran in the year 1917. Post-independence, Bihar emerged as a politically significant state, spread over an area of about 98,000 square kilometers Bihar has 40 seats in the lower house of parliament, the fourth highest in the country. The state is going to polls in all the seven phases of the 2024 general elections. The polling dates are April 19th and 26th, May 7th, 13th, 20th, 25th and June 1st. Bihar has 76.4 million registered voters, out of which 40 million are men, nearly 36.4 million are women, while over 2,200 belong to the third gender. Coming to the state's current political scenario, it is governed by the Janta Dal United with the support of the Bharatiya Janta Party. Other prominent parties are Rashtriya Janta Dal, the Indian National Congress and the Lok Jan Shakti Party. Looking at the 2019 general election results in Bihar, of the total 40 seats, BJP won on 17, while the JDU bagged 16, 
and the LJP got six seats, while the Congress backed just one. Amid the polls, all the eyes are keenly observing the volatile dynamics of coalitions in the state, which has always been springing up surprises at the last moment. Election Desk, DD India. And India celebrates Eid with great fervor and gaiety on Thursday, marking the end of the fasting month of Ramadan. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi extended Eid wishes to mark the occasion. Taking to social media platform X, Prime Minister Modi said, and I quote him, Best wishes on Eid ul-Fitr. May this occasion further spread the spirit of compassion, togetherness and peace. May everyone be happy and healthy. Eid Mubarak. Salman Haider joins us from Patna. Salman, uh, good morning. Now, Patna is home to Sher Shahi. Let us get a sense of how are the festivities there, how are people celebrating Eid? Yes, Preeti, Sheer Khorma is a delicious dish here. And uh, now the namaz, the prayer, the special prayers of Eid has happened. Uh, and over almost all uh, Eid gars and masjid, mosques. Uh, so the now, People are celebrating it in their homes. Uh, uh, delic uh, I mean, delicacies are being uh, released uh, in houses. Uh, as you know, sevanyas are the main uh, uh, attraction for uh, this Eid. And apart from that, the religious aspect is that uh, the people, after uh, offering prayers in mosques and Eidgahs, uh, uh, give alms and uh, uh, Zakat and Fitra. That is why it is called Eid ul Fitr. So the marginalized people also are taken care of, and uh, the people are in general very happy and they embraced each other uh, on the occasion. And uh, a lot of religious and festivities are in the air. Yes, Priti. All right, Salman, Eid greetings to you too. Thank you for joining in with those details. Have a good day of celebration and festivities. And up next, we take a look at other stories making it to the headlines from across India. India is celebrating the third day of Navratri to today. The temples recited prayers to Goddess Durga while a large number of devotees gathered to offer prayers and take part in the morning prayer to commence the third day of the nine-day Hindu festival of Navratri. As the country gears up for Rongali Bihu celebrations, the festive ambience fills Guwahati with vibrant arrangements being made to celebrate Assam's most significant festival. Preparations to celebrate the biggest festival of Assam are in full swing. Bohad Bihu is one of the most important festivals in Assam. The festival signifies the onset of agricultural season and is celebrated with great enthusiasm and fervor. A quick break ahead, but after the break, World Parkinson's Day is being observed today to create awareness about the progressive neurodegenerative disorder. Gold on its way to touch new highs. Stay with us to know all the action from the Indian and US stock markets. And World Athletics ends 128-year Olympic tradition set to become the first sport to offer prize money to Olympic champions in a landmark decision. As India decides in the world's largest election. We help you feel the pulse of the nation. I am Sakal Bhatt. I am Shubhain Dukhosh. This election season, join us on a journey of India. Discover the colours of democracy. Watch Pool Pulse on DD India. Thanks for being with us. You're watching the India News. Now, let's take a look at updates from the world of business now. Asian stocks traded higher on Wednesday. Fitch affirmed China's sovereign rating at A+, even though the outlook was downgraded to negative and it forecast economic growth this year would be slow. The Nikkei is looking to test 40,000 points again, with a yen's slight scene helping fuel that push. However, further weakness in the Japanese currency could prompt authorities to intervene. 
especially if the yen breaks 152 per dollar. Didi India correspondent Chris Gilbert joins us from Tokyo. Chris, we've seen that yen has weakened to record levels. What factors have led to this? Well, it's the same factor as it has been for these last two years. You know, a normal uh, you know exchange rate for the yen to the dollar is usually about 110, according to most experts. But we haven't seen that for about two years, uh, fluctuating between 140 to 150, uh, above 151 at the moment, touching 153 overnight. And the the, the main reason is that that uh, the divergence between the exchange rate hikes that we've seen in the U.S. and other major economies uh, compared to very low uh, to non-movement on exchange rates in Japan, which has had uh, less urgency to battle inflation throughout 2022 and 2023 as other major economies have. That's really pushed uh, the yen or uh, weakened it significantly against the U.S. dollar. Uh, and we've seen this historic, you know, 34 or 32, excuse me, uh, year milestone of 153 to the dollar, likely because uh, the interest rate cuts of, by the Federal Reserve, which are being expected in July, you know, those hopes have been dampened by sticky inflation over there, uh, and that's likely pushing the yen as well. All right, Chris, also, do we expect any intervention from the Bank of Japan? Well, if there, is a, if there is an intervention either by the Bank of Japan or by the government, they're not going to announce it necessarily ahead of time. Uh, the government last intervened uh, at the end of 2022 with a massive buy of the yen. And, uh, of course, they don't want to spook the markets or provoke speculators. And so these things are not necessarily disclosed at the time or on, indeed uh, well after. When it comes to the Bank of Japan, you know, they made a historic move just last month of hiking interest rates from negative 0.1 to 0.1%. Uh, and they said at that time that they want to keep monetary conditions accommodative to, to business and they don't intend to hike any further in the future. Now, that was based on the expectation that the Federal Reserve may be cutting rates in the summer. Now, if that is not going to happen or if hopes of that happening are dampening, it may be time to go back to the drawing board for the Bank of Japan and some uh, commentators are already speculating whether another hike may be on the books, which would be extraordinary at the moment, um, but that is uh, a conversation for the bank to have uh, for their next meeting in the coming months. All right, Chris, thank you for joining in with those details. The price of 24 carat gold went up by rupees 10 in early trade on Thursday with 10 grams of the precious metal trading at 72,110 rupees. The price of silver also went up by 100 rupees with one kilogram of the precious metal selling at 85,600 rupees. Getting you the market action now after inflation data diminished hopes that the Fed would begin cutting interest rates as early as June, U.S. stocks tumbled to a lower close. All the three major U.S. stock indices veered sharply lower at the opening bell. Equity prices were further pressured by benchmark treasury yields, which breached 4.5% to touch the highest level since November. Financial markets have now priced in a dwindling 16.5% likelihood of a 25 basis point Fed rate cut in June down from 56% just prior to the report's release. All right, on to updates from the world of sports now. Athletics is set to become the first sport to introduce prize money at the Olympics, with World Athletics saying on Wednesday that it would pay $50,000 to 48 gold medalists in Paris. The move is a symbolic break with the amateur pass of the Olympics in one of the game's most watched events. In the modern Olympics, which started in 1896 in Athens, athletes have not received prize money from the International Olympic Committee. The prize money will come out of the share of Olympic revenue that the IOC distributes to world athletics. A total of $540 million was allocated to the 28 sports at the Tokyo Games, with World Athletics receiving the most at $40 million. Spanish club Barcelona beat French club Paris Saint-Germain 3-2 on Wednesday in the first leg of the Champions League quarter-final clash. Brazil forward Rafinha scored twice to help Barcelona secure a win at Paris Saint-Germain in a lively match. Barca have earned their first win in the knockout stage in four years. 
Paris Saint-Germain forward Kylian Mbappe was nowhere to be found as five times European champions Barca managed to neutralize France's captain. The hosts came into the match unbeaten in their last 27 games in all competitions but were undone by a fired up Barcelona side looking to return the club to the summit of European football. Spanish club Atletico Madrid B German club, club Borussia Dortmund in another quarterfinal first leg in Spain on Wednesday. Atletico Madrid struck twice in a dominant first half but had to survive a late fight back from Dortmund before earning a 2-1 win. The Spaniards are looking for their first semi-final spot in seven years. Dortmund struggled to get the ball out of their half and another defensive error allowed Lino to double their lead in the 32nd. World Parkinson's Day is observed on 11th of April to create awareness regarding the ailment. This day also marks the birth anniversary of Dr. James Parkinson, who identified Parkinson's as a medical condition. Parkinson causes progressive damage to the nervous system. 60-year-old Baljeet Singh Bedi suffers from Parkinson's disease. 12 years ago, his hands started experiencing sudden tremors and when he consulted doctors, he was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Though after treatment started, his condition has gradually improved. Parkinson's disease is a neurodegenerative disorder. Common symptoms include tremors of the palms, arms, legs, jaw or head, muscle stiffness, slowness of the movement, impaired balance, which sometimes causes the person to fall, difficulty in swallowing, chewing and speaking. Timely identification and treatment of Parkinson's disease can help the patient live a better life. दवाई अर्ली स्टेज में बहुत अच्छा इफेक्टिव है लेट स्टेज में भी हम लोग जब सर्जरी भी करते हैं डीबीएस भी करते हैं तो भी गोली का कुछ सर्जरीज ऐसे होते हैं जिसमें गोली का असर कम माने गोली का डोज हम कम कर सकते हैं कुछ ऐसा पार्किंसन का टारगेट है जो गोली का डोज नहीं कम होती पर उससे भी वो टारगेट के साथ गोली देना हमें मिनिमम एक जरूरत पड़ती है इन इंडिया द डिजीज इज सीन इन पीपल ऑफ 50 इयर्स ऑफ एज एंड अबव देयर आर अबाउट 16 पार्किंसन्स पेशेंट्स पर 1 लाख ऑफ पॉपुलेशन इन द कंट्री According to the World Health Organization, the prevalence of Parkinson's disease has doubled across the globe in the past 25 years. Though there is no cure, therapies including medicines, surgery and rehabilitation can reduce the symptoms. Nitendra Singh, DD India. All right, with that, we come to the end of this edition of DD India News Hour. But let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. You can connect with us on Facebook, X and also Instagram. We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I'm Preeti Kaur signing off and from all of us here in Delhi, thanks for watching DD India News Hour.